Welcome to the Disney Parks Podcast with your hosts, Tony Castlenova from DisneyByTheNumbers.com and Krista Joy from DisneyWays.com. Keep your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the podcast at all times and get ready for the Disney Parks Podcast. And welcome to the show. For 40 years, our guest today has been an actor, writer, director, and consultant for Disney, Universal, Six Flags on both coasts, as well as numerous themed dinner attractions and events across America and Canada. Some of his favorite roles include the comic lead at Disneyland's Golden Horseshoe Review and strolling along Epcot walkways as Dreamfinder and Figment for Disney's Epcot Center. You'll want to check out his book for sure. We'll talk more about that. From Dreamer to Dreamfinder, A Life and Life. Lessons learned in 40 years behind a name. Ron Schneider, thank you for being on the show with us today. Thank you, Krista, for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. That's great. Hey, Ron, the, the first question I love to ask uh, people like yourself uh, and guests that come on the show is, how did you get started with Disney? What made you, you know, say, hey, you know what? I, I think I want to go apply to that crazy entertainment company over there, that Disney thing. Um, well, I started uh, quite young because I was at Disneyland the day it opened in 1955. Uh, the first day it was open to the public, uh, July 18th. Uh, my father had done some of the air conditioning work on the park originally, and so we had complimentary passes for that day. And so I uh, have vague memories of that very, very early visit. Uh, grew up going to the park uh, at least twice a year, and uh, always loved it, always loved uh one watch the wonderful world of Disney, wonderful world of color. Uh, whenever they, especially whenever they did anything from the park, when they had Walt previewing the attractions for the New York World's Fair or like that. It was in 1970 that I was visiting the park with uh, friends, and uh, I saw the Golden Horseshoe Review uh, for uh, the for the first time, and I saw Wally Bogue was the comic of the Golden Horseshoe. By that time, he'd been performing the show for 15 years. And I saw this man on stage having the time of his life, and everybody's laughing hysterically, and I thought, I want to be him. And it uh, turns out, as I've learned in the last few years, that there were a number of us that had the same exact experience. Saw Wally, and were inspired by him. Steve Martin was one, and uh, three other gentlemen who went on to understudy Wally, as I did, um, had the same exact experience. They saw Wally perform and decided that's what they wanted to do. I became fascinated with Walt Disney when uh, when he passed away in 66. It kind of struck me as a young teenager uh, what tremendous impact he had on my life. And I began studying uh, Disneyland, the history of the place and how it worked. I was fascinated with it. I had already been involved in acting and puppetry and magic and performing on an amateur level. But when I was at Disneyland, I sensed that there was something going on here that was beyond people just going on rides that this was a form of theater, it was a form of performance. And, but in this type of theater, the audience is on stage, and the show is their experience. The name of the show is not uh, Main Street, it's your experience of Main Street. This fascinated me as a form of communication. So I began studying uh, how that worked, how the people interact with the shows, with the uh, other the live performances. And um, the more I looked into it, the more fascinated I became with it. I studied, continued to study uh, acting and directing in high school and college, but always in the back of my mind was a fascination with Disneyland at the way it worked. After I saw Wally in 1970, um, I started, I had a goal, a concrete goal, something I wanted to do, uh, to be a part of that Golden Horseshoe Review Show. And uh, so I spent the next 10 years working at Universal Studios, working at various themed restaurants, I worked at Six Flags Magic Mountain for a number of years, performing all the time with an idea towards preparing myself for uh, that one particular job at uh, Disneyland. And uh, miraculously, in 1980, Disneyland was celebrating its 25th anniversary, and they were looking for a second cast for the Golden Horseshoe to do the nighttime shows. And I uh, went in and auditioned. I was exactly what they were looking for. And so that got me in with... Um, with Disneyland. Uh, prior to that, I'd already been with Universal Studios. I'd been a creative manager for a $3 million theme restaurant they had. I was a tour guide on the studio tour back in the 76. Uh, I can say a number of theme restaurants. 
But uh, this fascination with that form of live interaction with the audience, where I, I, I think of it as I do a two-person act and the other person doesn't know their lines. And it's my job to communicate with them and draw them out in a way that will involve them in the story I'm telling. And uh, to me, this has been a fascinating study and it's something that I've been doing, as you say, for uh, 40 years. Wow. So uh, what were some of the things that you did at Disneyland? And you know, tell us a little bit about Disneyland back then, because, you know, it's a completely different experience today from what it was, uh, you know, back in even the 80s, uh, and even back in 1955 when you first saw it. So. Oh, yeah. There's there's a there's a few uh, blogs online. Uh, Dave Land was mm-hmm. one. Uh, Stuff in the Park. And gorillas don't blog. These three, if you go them to them on a daily basis, these wonderful people post pictures of Disneyland from the fifties, sixties, and seventies, and you can get a feeling for what the park was like. It was a very, very different animal. Uh, this was back in the days uh, before it cost a hundred dollars to get into the park. It was in back in the days before uh, annual passports, and um, when you had to give up a ticket. In order to get on a ride, you had to make a sacrifice. And so going on a ride was a much more special occasion, a more special occurrence than it has become in the years since when you pay one price and you can just go on Space Mountain endlessly if you want to. Uh, we had to give up a ticket to go on Pirates of the Caribbean. It was a special, a special moment. And I think that's something that's, uh, that we've lost with the uh, one price uh, covers all. Uh, admission uh, is a lot we've gained, but this is one of the special things I think that we've lost and that I, I kind of miss. Yeah. Uh, back in the days before, there were four lines in front of every attraction. You got your fast pass, you get to get your fast pass, you got your standard waiting, you got the single riders, and every it all becomes about conquering the the horrible wait time. Back in those days. Uh, Disneyland, a, a successful trip to Disneyland, I realized quite young, was about who you go with and sharing that experience of that queue line. The queue lines moved faster because there was only one queue line and you didn't have people who were cutting in front of you, whether they had a fast pass or not. And you enjoyed your, your time in line because you were with people that you wanted to be with and wanted to spend time with and wanted to share that time with. Uh, I found that, you know, I, as Disneyland became my hobby. I studied the history of it. And I, one of the things that I did when I was in high school was an honest to God hobby with me. I would take, well, I would find people who'd never been to Disneyland and uh, take them for their first visit. I would tell them about the history of the park and I would uh, enlighten them about what made the park special. And I would uh, enjoy watching their reactions, not knowing what was going to come up, what was going to happen. And uh, I would show them around. You could give them uh, behind the scenes stuff at the same time. Uh, easing their way so that they could, in without making any of the mistakes for the first time or might make, uh, fully enjoy their first visit. So whenever I met anybody who said, I've never been to Disneyland, I would jump on them and say, uh, uh, how I'm going to take you. In 1969, as a matter of fact, I went to Disneyland 20 times, uh, just taking people who'd never been before. And uh, sometimes, you know, twice within one I I couldn't get around. And um, so this is a, a, a lot of the things that have changed. One major change I noticed was I was working, as I say, on the 25th anniversary summer, uh, 1980. And uh, the first time the Disneyland was open for 24 hours was on the anniversary of July 17th. And uh, I worked that night. I got to perform at the Golden Horseshoe. But then I hung out in the park for the 24 hours. And it was a very, very different event. Uh, for one thing, Disney didn't realize what they had. They didn't realize how special it was going to be to people. So while they did manufacture uh, uh, special collector's merchandise for the 20th anniversary, they underestimated how much of that stuff would be uh, wanted. And uh, when the park opened on the day of the 20th anniversary, there was no commemorative merchandise, none of the special commercial commemorative merchandise left. It had already been all bought up. Uh, then the event itself was not a tremendous crushing attendance as it is now when they do a 24-hour party. Um, it was very lightly attended. 
and it was extremely pleasant because everywhere you went, you met, you ran into people who would not think of being anywhere else in the world on that night. They had to be there. And it was so friendly and so calm and so relaxing to sit at Aunt Jemima's pancake house and watch the sun come up over Tom Sawyer's island while you're having breakfast by the the Zoo of America in the years before there was phantasmic and completely messing up (laughs) the river's traffic and and making that whole end of the park a congestive nightmare. Um, So a lot of that, uh, the park feeling, park like feeling that Walt wanted and Cheryl so treasured uh, has been lost and the mass consumption, the the desire to uh, get as many people in, uh, I think that uh, it's not entirely Disney's fault. I think that uh, the the fan community, we people right here, (laughs) are uh, guilty of it. I think the internet community, it's a wonderful thing that we have. At the same time, we've kind of uh, stretched the seams a bit and uh, we've lost some of that charm. Yeah. You know, I I like that uh, when you're talking about getting on the attraction and and you had to give up that ticket. You know, I agree with you 100 percent, because nowadays when people pay that hundred and five dollars, they feel an entitlement that they need and have to ride everything in the park (laughs) and they can't leave until it's all done. And uh, that's not the way it was when, you know, you had to give up that ticket. You only had, you know, a certain amount of A tickets and B tickets and E tickets. And you couldn't ride Space Mountain continuously all day long because you only had, you know, a handful of E tickets. Um, so I, I agree with you 100 percent. It's, it's kind of lost its little charm. But, um, you know, I, I think we're after a different goal, which is, you know, revenue <laughs> and not entertainment. Well, I I can't agree with that last statement. I think that uh, Disney uh, realizes that uh, the key to revenue is entertainment and putting out the quality uh, of, of work. Now they don't they don't always hit that mark. Uh, I think that sometimes the company is burdened by the Disney image uh, and by the uh, corporate desire to entertain everybody. And uh, one of the things that uh, I think has has long been uh, true of the Disney uh, company is that the the company strives to entertain them. They think of the audience as other. Uh, And as a result the people who are creating the entertainment often are producing things that they themselves would not necessarily find entertaining. Uh, they look at it and say, well, that's cute. They'll like that. That's uh, one of the quotes actually in my book. The Imagineer actually told a friend of mine, says, well, if it's cute, uh, it doesn't really matter. They'll like it as long as it's cute. Well, if I'm shelling out $105 for entertainment, I don't really want it to be cute. I want it to be entertaining. I don't want jokes that are cute. I want jokes that are going to make me laugh. Um, This is one of the differences. uh, This goes back to the days of the 30s and 40s of Disney animation. You look at the Disney cartoons, the Mickey Mouse, I love Donald Duck, I love Goofy cartoons, but you can look at them and you can see that the Disney company is doing things for an audience that is not themselves. Compare those to the Warner Brothers cartoons where the animators were all shoved together in a terrible atmosphere. They called it Termite Terrace. But they were doing cartoons that would make them laugh. They were trying to amuse each other, people that they loved and respected. And that's why the Warner Brothers cartoons are still funny. Whereas Mickey Mouse cartoons, while beautifully produced, are cute. Uh, this is uh, one of the secrets to the success of Universal Studios in live entertainment. When they, they get it right... It's because the people who are running Universal Studios um, are very demanding, and I've worked for those people, directly for those people, that they want stuff that they themselves find entertaining, whereas Disney, especially in the live entertainment uh, area, tends to look at things and says, well, as long as it's cute and well-produced and clean and wholesome, uh, the audience and them are going to be fine with it. Uh, 
I, I think that they, they focus on entertainment. The quality of their entertainment is exemplary. But at the same time, I find 50% of the time the shows that they produce um, are lacking. Uh, the example I always use is the Tower of Terror opened on the same day as Food Rocks. Uh, Food Rocks for me wasn't that great a show. Tower of Terror, on the other hand, was a home run. Still one of the greatest experiences they've ever created. So, all right, so how did you get then from Disneyland to being the dream finder in Epcot? Oh, wow. Well, um, I was a, it was, it was a dream come true, as I told you, for me to be at the Golden Horseshoe Review to be part of that tradition. The show had been running for 15 years when I joined it. It was in the Guinness Book of World Records, longest running live stage show in the history of the world. It's still listed. And it was a tremendous honor and a joy for me to be on that stage. Uh, but it was while I was there that Wally Bo announced he was going to retire. And uh, I kind of thought maybe I'd be able to step in uh, and, and take the full-time job, but that was not to be. Uh, they went with a different comic, somebody who was actually much better suited to the Disney image than I was. But about this time, uh, one of the great things about working at Disneyland is that you can network with the company and you can get to know the Imagineers and you can take a peek behind the curtain. And Tony Baxter, the great Imagineer Tony Baxter, was doing a presentation at the Disney University about uh, careers at Imagineering. And of course, I just had to be there. And as Imagineers used to do back in those days, before there was the internet, uh, he spent a lot of time talking about the project that he was working on at that time. There they didn't have the tremendous need for secrecy back then because there weren't as many people who were uh, passing the notes around and, uh, and budding in everybody's business. So he was talking about the new project of Epcot Center and his show, The Journey into Imagination. He told us about the ride and he showed us some of the graphics and he held a picture of the Dream Finder and figures and said, these two characters are going to be the only characters at Epcot Center. There'll be no Mickey Mouse and Mickey Mouse is going to live over at the Magic Kingdom, Dreamfinder and Figment are going to be the Disney characters created for that concept. And when I heard him say that and saw that picture, I had the exact same feeling that I had uh, 12 years prior when I first saw Wally Bo. I knew what I wanted to do next. I knew where I wanted to end. So I contacted a friend of mine at Imagineering. Uh, his name is Ken Lacey. He ran the sound department over there. I said, Ken, have you got a recording of the Dreamfinder voice from the attraction? Because I'd like to learn how to do this voice. I'm interested in playing the role. He got me a recording of the uh, attraction, the opening scene of the attraction, and then he introduced me to Tony. And I got a little backstage tour at Imagineering. I got to see the first scene of the ride all set up. It had just been programmed. And then I went, uh, having got the voice down, I went to the head of talent booking at Disneyland who was also casting for the people at uh, Epcot, and I said, uh, I'm interested in doing this Dream Fighter character. And by this time, you know, I'd been already entertaining, doing magic and puppetry for 20-some years, and uh, 10 years in theme parks, and I just got to walk right into the job. That's incredible. Now, did you always know that you wanted to perform? Because you've got such a history with acting and, you know, in show business in general. Is it something you were born knowing that you wanted to do all these, all these things? I tend to think so, yeah. I was uh, back in, uh, I was, you know, I'm from Southern California. And Los Angeles local television was filled with the live uh, kid show hosts back in those days. There was... Uh, and these are afternoon shows, anywhere from a half hour to an hour long, and they would show cartoons, they would have kids on the air, and they would play games, and there were hosts. Uh, Tom Hatton, Skipper Frank, uh, Engineer Bill, Chuckle the Birthday Clown, Bozo, of course, uh, Sheriff John. These were all live performers that would be on five days a week. They would talk directly to the camera, and uh, they were my friends. They were people mm -hmm. that I admired, and... Um, there was a special show on the weekends, two special shows on the weekends. There was Sherry Lewis, uh, it was a wonderful, beautiful young lady who uh, did magic and ventriloquism. And there was uh, Mark Wilson, who had a television show called The Magic Land of Alakazam. Uh, he, with his wife, Nami Darnell, and Rico the Magic Clown, um, on Saturday mornings would do a one-hour show from Television City in Hollywood and uh, with the live magic on the air. And uh, I saw this, the magic, and I saw the puppetry, and this became a fascination for me. When I was eight years old, 
My sainted mother uh, bought me uh, my own puppet stage and marionettes. She got me a beautiful Jerry Mahoney ventriloquist dummy. She bought me a magic set. And uh, I started entertaining uh, the family back then. And it's something that always stuck with me. I started doing plays at the local park when I was about eight years old. And, um, yeah, the, the, the bug bit me early and stayed with me. And then I was lucky to, uh, in, when I started going to school, I lucked into a team of very, very talented kids I met at Palms Junior High School. And a wonderful teacher, Alan Josephsburg, was my first drama teacher and uh, a lifelong friend of mine. And these same talented people that I was with at Palms worked with me through Hamilton High School, Los Angeles City College, and we stayed together for many years and uh, just kind of grew up together on stage. That's very interesting. That's um, awesome. I guess, you know, as Dreamfinder, it's such a uh, character. I mean, when, just when you say that to people, you know, people's faces light up. Uh, you know, being that character, Ron, you must have had some very interesting, you know, magical experiences with uh, guests out in Epcot. Uh, do you have any good stories that you want to share with us? No, too many. <laughs> um, it's, it's funny. Somebody asked me that recently about uh, special moments. And um, I, it made me realize that uh, I was the special moment for the guest. Um, I've always heard this, that uh, through the years, that there are people who met me or Steve Taylor, who was uh, our number two Dreamfinder, and, and any of the other guys. There was uh, several of us who played Dreamfinder through the years. I was the first and uh, was there for the first five years. Uh, but uh, they always remember that moment of meeting Dreamfinder and Figment. And uh, so they really have the special memories. Uh, uh, I met, I uh, got to meet a lot of very famous and wonderful people. I got to meet Michael Jackson. I got to meet science fiction author Ray Bradbury, which is kind of funny because I grew up uh, three blocks from where Ray Bradbury lived, but I didn't meet him until uh, uh, I was doing Drink Finder. And I got to meet all of the uh, top people at Disney. I got to meet uh, Red Skelton and uh, Jimmy Nelson, a famous ventriloquist, a lot of famous people. And uh, that was always special for me, working with the, uh, the Give Kids the World people and meeting those special children was always a wonderful experience. And um, the, the story that I, I keep telling over and over, because it's, it's by everybody's favorite, is the story about the little child I met uh, one day when I was walking off set, uh, walking, hurrying to get off set. You know, I was, my shift was over that particular time, and uh, I had to make it back to my dressing room without getting stopped, otherwise I never would have gotten out of there. And I broke through this group of people, and I was about five feet from the backstage door. And I looked down, and there is this adorable child looking up at me, maybe about five or six years old. And his eyes are as big as saucers, and he sees me, and I see him. I look around. There's no other kids around there, so I figure I can stop and talk to him, and I probably won't get swamped. So I kneel down, and I talk to him. I introduce him to the dragon, and uh, we talk briefly, and he's... He starts to cry. He's starting to weep while I'm talking to him. Uh, and I sense that, you know, it's because he's just overwhelmed by the whole experience. Finally, I got to leave. I stand up. I say, well, i got to go now. Goodbye. And he looks up at me and he says, bye-bye, Jesus. Goodbye, Jesus. And <laughs> tears are pouring down. Everybody's standing around watching this and laughing hysterically. I couldn't move. I was just standing there waving goodbye. He's going goodbye to you. And I could just imagine him going home and telling everyone, you know, back where he came from me, I met him. I met him. And he has two heads and he called me by my name. Uh, and that to, to me is always been one of my advice. Not just magical, but religious experiences. Yeah, that that got it. <laughs> I love that story. I'm, I've heard that one before, but I love it every time. Um, and do you, um, let's talk about your book for a little bit. So you have this wonderful book and it's done really well. Can you tell everybody what it's about and uh, why you wrote it, who it's for, all that good stuff? Well, back when I was first starting in theme parks, uh, working for Six Flags Magic Mountain at Universal, really studying how this whole thing works. I read something uh, in a training book, I think Dick Nunes or Van France, they were the people who created the original University of Disneyland, that they wrote that said, um, nobody 
studies, uh, goes to college to learn how to work in a theme park. And no parents raise their kids to do that. And um, I realized that if I was going to learn how to do this, I was going to have to teach myself. I was going to have to get the experience myself, do the research myself, because there was no place to turn to, to learn this stuff. There were books written about Walt Disney, and there were picture books about Disneyland, but there was nothing about how the themed interaction, that particular form of performance storytelling works. And I knew that I would have to teach it to myself. And after a few years of that, I began to think somebody should write a textbook on this because this is a, a, a whole new art form, something beyond film, something beyond theater, something that has the potential to embrace every craft, every skill, every art, every form of performance and put an audience on stage in the middle of things. And, and this is something that we need to explore, especially the live performance aspect of it, what, how that is done. And so it was always in the back of my mind through the years at Disneyland and Epcot that someday I might write a book on that. Uh, the, comes the 25th anniversary of Epcot Center, and uh, everybody turned out at Epcot, and I'm there. I got to do a presentation for the National Fantasy Fan Club about my experiences as Dreamfinder. And at the end of the uh, presentation, I ran into Jim Hill has Jim Hill Media and his wonderful website and I was a tremendous fan and he walks up to me and he says that's a book you need to write a book wow. so I uh, I am one of the great procrastinators of our time ladies and gentlemen and um, so I said yeah I'm going to write a book yes sir Ree Bob and so for several years anybody would ask me I would say, yes, I'm writing a book. And I wasn't writing a book. I wasn't doing that darn thing about it. But finally, one day, I was sitting down at lunch. Uh, and uh, over lunch, I finally wrote the first chapter, something about my youth in Los Angeles and that first trip to Disneyland. And uh, I put together a blog called From Dreamer to Dream Finder. Most of it's still up there. And uh, I posted that first chapter. A couple days later, I wrote a second chapter about uh, my early versus to, visits to Disneyland. I posted that, and I started getting feedback from people who were reading. And that's exactly what I needed to get me going. Six months later, I had completed 40 or so uh, chapters, and I had the complete story of uh, my career, uh, more of a memoir than an autobiography. Uh, I went back. I started to edit it. I started to switch things around, try to make it more affecting, more touching. And then I wrote, sat down and I wrote the textbook and uh, put the textbook at the end of the memoir. So the first 80% of the book is the story of what I learned and how I learned it. And then the last 20% is a textbook about how to write and perform and create themed entertainment, live themed entertainment. Wow. I don't deal so much with attractions, uh, the art of attractions and everything like that. I think that's been it's starting to be covered pretty much now in uh, a lot of the books out there. But my experience with live performance in a wide variety of venues, I've worked in everything from big stage productions to intimate stage shows, to themed dinner shows, and I've done everything from uh, performing to writing to directing to producing. There are certain truths throughout all of that, certain uh, principles of this particular kind of communication that uh, I set forward in the book. And... Uh, that's, uh, I was lucky enough to stumble on a wonderful, wonderful guy named Leonard Kinsey who uh, put the book together for me and uh, got it published, got it out there on uh, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads, and we've got, now we've got a hard cover, we've got a soft cover, we've got uh, a digital format, and we, I even did a nine-hour uh, audio book, which was, uh, had a wonderful reception. Probably need to get the audio book. I love audio books. So. I, it's it's nine hours of me talking and it's the <laughs> wonderful thing about it is it puts me right to sleep and nothing, <laughs> nothing in the world i found has been able to put me to sleep like the sound of my own voice <laughs> but i am proud to say that we've gotten some wonderful uh, feedback from people uh about my performance they they, they like to hear 
And my mother uh, was uh, spent an entire evening just sitting there listening to me talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I do like audiobooks, and, and I especially like when you know actors and actresses do their own. You know, rather than having some strange voice. I mean, there's nothing worse than you know, like somebody like Regis Philbin. I mean, he did his own, but if if somebody else would have done his book, I mean, it just sounds weird. You know, you expect to hear Regis telling the story and not you know somebody else. So I'm glad right. that you did your own. That was good. You know, you talk about uh, being a performer. There must have been some places that you like to have performed or ha- have performed that you'd like to go back to. Do you have any special places that you, you know, have done some stuff that you go, hey, you know what? If they ask me, I'll go back there anytime, any place. You know, anything? the Golden Horseshoe was such a dream situation. I mean, here's this gorgeous jewel box of a theater it, it's still there but they've taken down a lot of the uh set dressings there was a tremendous collection of, of steer horns on the walls and uh, it's kind of uh, bare and compared to what it looked like back then uh but this beautiful jewel box theater that was uh created by the same people who uh create the sets for hollywood big hollywood pictures and uh, it was a historic place walt and lily disney celebrated their wedding anniversary there two weeks before Disneyland opened and there was a performance of the Golden Horseshoe. The Waltz box was the box on stage on the left that he would come whenever he was in the park. He would always come and see the shows there. Uh, the people who worked there, the whole way the, the thing operated was just gold. And then the audience would stand outside in a line waiting to come in to the air conditioning and the great food and sit down. And you're performing a show that was not scripted by Disney Entertainment. It was the creation of the people who were doing the show. So Wally Bogue created his shifts, his stuff. And Fulton Burley, our Irish singer, he created his stuff. He brought his own sense of humor uh, to it. And Betty Taylor was a brilliant singer. She brought uh, professional uh, experience to it. We had great dancers, wonderful music. And um, the show worked every single time like clockwork. You got the laughs, you got the chills, and I was part of a tradition that had started in 1955 and wound up running until 1986. Five and ten shows a day, the same show. And it was polished to a fair deal. At the same time, it was always fresh. The people who worked there, all of us, kept it absolutely fresh, and we were always in the moment and playing it as if it never happened before, and the audience was there to see that show that they love. And I only got to do it for two years. It broke my heart to leave. Even though I was coming to Florida to create the Dream Finder, just broke my heart to leave. And I could have easily lasted there 10, 15 years and been very, very happy doing that show. The, the real challenge of doing a theme park show and the real value of it is the repetition and the long run. You do shows now, if, if you get a show on Broadway, you're lucky if it runs uh, a year and a half, maybe two years. The Golden Horseshoe, you got to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over, and over which is something that vaudeville had going for it. And for less, you have a chance to polish a particular piece of business to the point where you know it's always going to work. That's an experience that people don't have. Performers mm-hmm. just don't have that, except in theme parks. In theme parks, you have a chance to get a, get a couple hundred performances under your belt of a role and polish that thing to a fairly well. And I love that. I dearly love that. I could go back there in a second. Uh, I especially love working at Universal Studios with the Celebrity Lookalikes. Uh, those people and the creative freedom we had those first uh, couple of years at Universal Studios. Uh, but as inevitably does, management's changed, philosophies changed, and one day management decided that Laurel and Hardy weren't funny anymore, and the Marx Brothers weren't amusing anymore, and so they asked them. And uh, it was funny because the characters actually, we had funeral services for the lookalike <laughs> look oh, program. I got to uh, deliver the eulogy uh, at uh, John McConnell's house. He was one of our people. Uh, it was sad to see that uh, process go. They just got rid of the Blues Brothers in, in California, Universal Studios out there. But the show's still running out here. I don't know for how much longer. 
so there's a lot, a lot of things. I would love to do go back to do 1520 AD. 1520 AD was a uh, medieval themed restaurant in Los Angeles. It was one of the first in the country. Uh, it opened in Anaheim back in, uh, I guess, 1970, uh, 69 or 70, and was such a success that it opened up all over the country. And uh, in fact, we, we had a running in a motel in Anaheim at the same time they opened a club in Los Angeles. We had three different showrooms in this massive club in Los Angeles, all three showrooms running the same show, each room, two performances a night. And it was an evening with Henry VIII and his court. Very bawdy, very cathartic, loud, boisterous. Uh, and nobody had seen anything like that back then. A lot of the great people from the Renaissance Pleasure Fairs helped put the thing together. And I you know, lucked into that quite early on. I became uh, King Henry VIII, trained in Los Angeles, and then uh, wound, out, wound up uh, in the San Diego Club for over a year. And that was a terrific experience. Any kind of themed uh, dinner show like that, I love that, because you get to sleep in until all hours. And then you get up, you report to work at 5 o'clock in the evening, and uh, the themed dinner show is the long form of what we do in theme parks. So the theme park show is going to run like the Golden Horseshoe was about 28 minutes. Uh, Dream Finder, you're out there with people for 30 minutes, but they're only going to spend uh, two, three minutes with you. Whereas at, the, the, uh, at Fort Liberty, the show that I created for Robert Earl, Kissimmee, or 1520 AD, the audience comes in, sits down there in air conditioning, you feed them, you can theme the food, and you have their undivided attention for an hour and a half to two hours. You can tell a story. You can give them a, a role to play in the story. And uh, they're not, you're not competing with Space Mountain or the noise of what's going on behind them. Uh, it's a comfortable, wonderful, warm place to work. You do two shows a night, maybe. And uh, again, long run, you can polish the heck out of what you're doing, and switch where it all works. I love that form. I love doing that. I've been fortunate to do seven different themed dinner shows, mm. uh, several of which I've written or managed. And uh, it's always rewarding. Incredible. And, and tell everybody about what you're doing now with your cabaret. Uh, well, I'm, right now I'm uh, kind of at liberty and doing uh, shows for different theater groups in Orlando. I've been working with the Orlando Shakespeare Festival, uh, Outdoors Ice House Theater. And right now I'm over at uh, Mad Cow Theater, which is located on Church Street Station, downtown Orlando. It's a beautiful intimate theater. I've done a number of shows with them through the years. Every year they do uh, a cabaret festival uh, in uh, late April or May. And uh, every year, part of that cabaret festival, they, they bring in uh, cabaret singers and performers from uh, New York and from all over the country. And uh, wonderful special shows uh, focusing on music and live performance. Every year the, they start a tradition that they would do two or three shows that would be uh, called It Was a Very Good Year. And they would uh, pick uh, two or three years and would focus on presenting in one hour uh, the best popular music from that particular year. Last year was my first year doing it. Um, I got to write and direct the shows, working with a talented group of people last year. This year, uh, we're doing uh, uh, two shows, they're doing 1968 and 1978. And I have the best talent. We've got one of the Dapper Dans is working with us. We've got a live performer from Diagon Alley is working with us. Wonderful, talented people, four kids that are so brilliant. We have a wonderful musical director, Philip King, is our musical director. Man's a genius. And uh, we're having a ball putting this thing together. We open on uh, April 24th. Uh, the shows will run uh, uh, one show a day, of either the 68 show or the 78 show. Uh, till I think uh, we close on May 9th is the last performance. And uh, you can find out all about that by uh, finding Mad Cow Theater uh, online and uh, have all the information about the Cabaret Fest. You can find them on Facebook. And, uh, and come on down. Uh, I, might, I might say to you that 68 shows better than 78, but I can't this year because both shows <coughs> excuse me, are equally funny and uh, exciting the music is wonderful and uh, we're doing songs from uh, hair and from Greece uh, Saturday Night to Fever and uh, we, we touch on country music uh, comedy music and uh, there's a lot of humor and well, just a lot of great singing 
Mm. All of my favorite things. And we'll definitely put um, links in the show notes as well. So everybody can check that out. Uh, So I guess the last, one of the last things, Ron is, you know, if somebody wants to be dream finder, you know, if they want to be the next dream finder, how would you advise them? What, what would you tell them to do? If you want that dream job, you want to be an imagineer, you want to be a dream finder, you want to be Molly Bogue, uh, whatever that is, uh, especially this is true in, in life, and I'll talk about first in life. Most important thing is to follow your bliss, to keep your eye on that prize and take every avenue that will take you in that direction. You, you, you know, I've had real jobs. I processed da- damaged luggage, and I sold appliances at WT Grants. Um, but all the time I was there, I was talking to people, and I was going to Disneyland, and I was doing my research. My heart was always with my goal. And whenever you get one of those jobs that take you in that direction, keep your eye on where you are and do the best work you possibly can because it's not the important thing. The way to move forward is to do good work where you are. And if you do that, the universe will see that and will reach out to you. When I was was so focused on working at Disneyland, I was working at Magic Mountain, which I enjoyed and I had wonderful opportunities and, and, I love my work there. But while I was while I was working at Magic Mountain, that unbeknownst to me, Disneyland heard about me. So that when I went to the Disneyland audition, and I was walking up on the stage to perform an audition for Sonny Anderson and Wally Bogue, as I was walking up to the stage, Sonny Anderson turned to Wally Bogue and said, this is the kid I told you about. It was a complete wow. surprise to me. I had no idea that they knew who I was. So part of the success of my getting that job that was so important was the fact that I had done kept my head down and done good work at Magic Mountain. Okay, so that's that's in, uh, how to get your dream job in a universal sense. Now, in theme parks, you want that dream job at Disney, the first or universal, the first thing to do is get into the park. Get a job in the park. Doing anything. Don't worry that you're not an Imagineer yet. Bus tables. Sweep up. Get into the park and find out what that's like. Find out what the front lines are like, what the people have to put up. One of the reasons that this is the the reason that this is so important is that once you're inside the park, you get an idea of what's really involved. And you can find, you can look behind the curtain, like I did with with, uh, listening to Tony Baxter. You can network within the company and you can get to know the people within the company and let them know that you exist. Once you've been there for a couple of years, you have an idea of the reality of it, get the hell out. Get out <laughs> of the park. Go away. Because it's, uh, you can move up from within the park. Tony Baxter did it. He was, he's the prime example. He got into the park. He scooped ice cream. He was a ride operator. He became known that way. But the, the fact is that people who are looking to cast a dream finder are looking for someone who already is a dream finder to fill that hole. Imagineers are not hired and then trained. Imagineers are found and then hired. So mm-hmm. that what you need to do is go somewhere else and do what it is that you want to be doing for your dream job. But do it somewhere else. Get the credits. Get the experience. Get years under your belt. Bitter experience in the real world doing this so that when they're looking for a storyteller looking for a designer you've got the degree you've got the experience you can come to them with a portfolio and say look what I've done I was able to walk into that Golden Horseshoe audition and be Wally Bogue I was able to do the medicine pitch that I had been doing for four years at Magic Mountain which was a perfect uh, audition for me to do the same kind of act at the Golden Horseshoe Review I have a friend of mine Larry Nikolai was worked in the tin type shop at uh, Spillican Corners of Magic Mountain then we used to get together, and he would tell me how someday he wanted to be an Imagineer. He, brought, he showed me a little model of a uh, flume ride that he designed. He, his big dream of being was being an Imagineer. But he was working, in the meantime, he was working at Magic Mountain. He was drawing maps. He became known as a graphic artist over there. Uh, he left Magic Mountain, started to work with um, former Imagineers. He created the Monster Plantation for um, one of the Six Flags parks. 
And he worked on a Lincoln robot for the Lincoln uh, Library in Illinois. And he got all this experience so that when they were looking for an Imagineer, Larry Nikolai worked his way in now. And he is the man responsible for the Little Mermaid Dark Ride and the Sinbad's Adventure at Tokyo Disney Seas. Um, is one of the great champions of Figment as a character with an Imagineer. He's keeping the character alive. Uh, in many ways, and uh, so we had lunch together, and it was the most amazing experience because here the two of us had both our dreams had come true, and we had even surpassed them, which uh, is the way to do it. So, yeah, you can you can be a dream finder, but you you need to be ready for that break when it comes. That's what luck is: is that when the opportunity comes, you have already done the preparation. Uh, you don't have to scramble because you're already there. I had all that experience from childhood, doing magic, doing puppetry. I had had uh, 12 years already in theme parks. So when they were looking for a dream finder, I just walked in the door and said, I want the job. Yeah. And would you agree? Do you think that there's no such thing as an overnight success that everybody works for what they have? I mean, occasionally, I guess it could happen. But what's your opinion? There is an overnight success in, in, in like, I mean... I was an overnight success in that I went to an audition for Disneyland's Golden Horseshoe Review, and overnight I was hired. I mean, right. they called me. They called me on April fifteenth, nineteen eighty, and said, "Come in tomorrow and start training." That's overnight. It took me ten years to get there for that overnight success. Mm -hmm. um, another great example is one of my favorite musical performers, Sutton Foster. She um, she was an understudy in a role for the uh, musical Thoroughly Modern Millie. Overnight, she filled in. Boom, she became a, a tremendous profit star. Um, yes, there's overnight successes, but you have to be ready to be that success. Yeah, I completely agree. That's so true. Wow, this has been fun. So now tell everybody where we can find you online. Um, are you, are you, do you still have your blogs and things? Or, or what's, where do we find you online? Um, I started a blog with my buddy, uh, Josh Young, uh, called Theme Park University. I did some writing for that uh, up front, but um, I'm no longer writing with that, but I will recommend that site to people who are interested in serious study of themed entertainment and the parks and interactive entertainment. Josh has done a wonderful job keeping that alive. My blog uh, from Dreamer to Dreamfinder is still out there on WordPress. Uh, I don't uh, write for it anymore, but the stuff is still up there. I took out a lot of the stuff so that people would have a reason to buy the book. And of course, the book can be found in Bamboo Forest Publishing, and you can go to uh, bamboofforestpublishing.com and order the book through them. You'll wind up paying more than you do for Amazon, but I'll be happy to send you an autographed copy that way. And I do personal appearances uh, at, uh, at various shows. You can find me on podcasts. You can find me on Facebook. I got uh, hundreds of Dreamfinder fans on Facebook uh, just looking for Ron Schneider. And uh, I'm always anxious to meet more. And, uh, and Krista does these wonderful dinners with me. Yes, so we need to have another one soon because what a joy and a pleasure that was. So um, if you already know that you would love to meet Ron and you're going to be in town, write to me and we'll try to plan it so you can come because um, we've only had one so far, but it was it was a smashing success and everybody really had a good time. Ron, you're so entertaining. We just we just love you so much. Thank you for being on the show and spending time with us tonight and we look forward to having you back. Absolutely. Thank you both. I had a ball. Oh, it's our pleasure. And thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you in the parks. The Disney Parks Podcast is not affiliated with the Walt Disney Company. All Disney Parks, attractions, lands, shows, event names, etc. are registered trademarks of the Walt Disney Company. Like a boat of the blue Fate steps in and sees you through